Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the general discussion series, and it is a question and answer session from people in San Diego. Presented by Jesus on the 3rd of November 2013 in San Diego, California, USA. This is session 2, part 1. Good morning. <laughs> How's everyone this morning? Yeah. Mm. So did you find yesterday inter interesting for those of you who came? Hmm? It's good. It's always good to have a good discussion with some people who are open. So um, overnight, did you think of any more questions that you had that you'd like to ask? Yes? Okay, well, we'll get started straight away. So let's come down to the front here. We'll start down to here, on this side. We talked about anger a few times yesterday. Yep. I wondered if you could tell me about cleansing the temple of the money changers. <laughs> Was I angry? <laughs> no, I wasn't angry. Yeah. So what I did was I um, basically shouted out to a group of people what they thought anyway. So what was happening in the temple in the first century was that it was basically a place where the priests could make a lot of profit. And of course they had deals with certain suppliers where the suppliers could come in into the temple and supply the sacrifices. To, for the forgiveness of sins. And under the Jewish law at the time, um, and you can read this in the Bible actually, because it's pretty close to what the Jewish law was stated in the Torah. Um, under the Jewish law, we, we had to basically have a sacrifice or different types of sacrifices for different types of sins. And of course, all of those sacrifices meant some animal had to die. And that was basically the underlying uh, premise of all sacrifice for sin. And so what happened was that uh, the temple became like this great big clearing house of, of, of stock, livestock, uh, right the way through from birds or doves, right the way through to cattle and sheep and, uh, and almost everything in between. Now, each animal that was sacrificed had to have what was called a cloven hoof and it had to have a split hoof. So basically that precluded certain things like horses getting sacrificed, but generally there was a lot of animals sitting in the temple, in the temple itself. And, and basically they had a big auditorium where they'd have like all the animals. And you imagine the stench of the place, it was pretty bad. And, uh, and then they would sell these animals for an exorbitant price. So just because, and you couldn't buy the sacrifice from anywhere else. You, you couldn't, they didn't allow you at the time to bring in a sacrifice of your own from your own flock or something like that, which the Lord did allow you to do. But they decided that they wanted to make it all nice and holy and only the best animals were chosen, which, and it was all just subterfuge in the end and, and deceit. So what happened was that the majority of people in the temple got, were getting pretty angry about the whole thing, about the whole um, you know, situation, the total situation which was basically that if they wanted to do what the Torah suggested, they had to buy the animals from the people who were selling them in the temple at exorbitant prices. And most of the time these prices were like ludicrous prices, you know, not the average prices, but 10 times to 20 times higher than the average prices of what they could have bought the animal for outside of the temple. And so there was quite a lot of anger about this inside the, uh, the average person who was there. And all I did was shout out about that. Uh, all I did was, at the top of my voice, <laughs> so that everybody could hear, <laughs> say, how long are you going to put up with this deceit and, and manipulation, basically? And of course, everybody started getting pretty angry. They connected to their anger after that, which is not my underlying desire, but they connected to the anger and then they had a riot in the temple. Uh, and so now in the Bible it's said that I caused this riot because I was angry and I turned over the tables, which I, I never did. Because I would never do such a thing. But it is an interesting question about anger. Um, 
the way most people handle anger is, is very interesting, in fact. For the majority of people, anger is a passive-aggressive thing. I don't know if you've noticed that in your society, but it's very common here, I notice, when we're, when we're here, how passive-aggressive everyone is with their anger. When I say passive-aggressive, do you understand what I mean by that? Like, it's like simmering inside, but never allowed to be really expressed except using some basic techniques that the average American actually um, supports or, you could say, allows. So here's some of the techniques. Technique number one that you have is sarcasm. Huh? Have you noticed that? I, it's interesting the humour that you have on telly. And we've watched a little bit of telly since we've been here. We don't have a telly at home, so we watched a little bit of telly and we're just watching the type of humour you have. Now, your type of humour generally wouldn't work at all in Australia, which is interesting because particularly the talk shows that are meant to be funny. You know the talk back shows that you have that are meant to be funny? Well, from an Australian's perspective, they, they don't sound very funny to us. They sound like a heap of sarcasm directed at other people, which uh, brings me to the second form of expression of anger, which is criticism. But it's not criticism, or, or you could say criticism where the person's inviting it, it's criticism of everybody possible, right, basically. Um, in other words, it's done to build up yourself and pull down another. So, build up self, and so is the sarcasm. And pull down another. That's the primary um, motivations, it appears. So, sarcasm, criticism. Now, these are not what you would e most people would even classify as anger-based um, actions, but they are. They are driven by internal rage about things. Any other ideas of what you do as a society to address your anger? Sorry, gossip? Yes, gossip's great, yeah. And in fact, uh, one of the things that amazes us sometimes, even in Australia, sometimes if, you know, when we travel we get to turn on telly occasionally, it's pretty rare, but um, sometimes we've noticed that there's gossip, like people who are experts in gossip from the US, who actually appear on Australian television. <laughs> it's a, like, we go, whoa, <laughs> that's amazing, you know. They've got no idea what they're saying is true or not. And, and in fact, uh, oftentimes it doesn't really matter to... Uh, and what we've noticed in Australia is it doesn't matter on television there whether they present the truth or not. They don't care whether they present the truth or not. Um, and it seems to me that the US is very similar to Australia in that way. That, you know, that it doesn't seem to care whether it's true or not. It's just a way of getting a laugh or discussing somebody. And really it's pulling down people generally. And I think this is why um, a lot of people in the US are so fascinated with actors and actresses and their lives and music stars and their lives and what's going on with their lives and so forth. Because it makes them feel better about their own life <laughs> a lot of the times. Anything else you do? Sorry? Par the party scene? Yeah, I think there's even bigger things than that that we can list, so let's... Uh, Peaceable assembly. We're talking about how you express your anger in your society. If we use the mics, if you're going to make any comment other than the single one. <laughs> the sit-in that we had with the 99% versus the 1% in our country. Right. We had a whole big uh, problem with that that people were very angry about, so they decided to camp out in the streets. Right, okay, so you could say, um, what? Okay. protest, yeah, uh, peaceable protest, ostensibly peaceable protest, but sometimes it turns violent, of course. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Lawrence, you were going to say? So if we just hand the mics around. 
I think sometimes when people hold, up, hold it up a people don't show up on time if they're late. Yeah. It's a form of uh, anger, passive aggression. Okay, so again, protest is another. So that, so if we write it down, protest as another form of all f types of forms. Right. It was funny, um, we were, went on the train yesterday. You call it the trolley here, don't you? And, um, and we were, it, it was a packed trolley, it was peak hour, it was a packed trolley. And uh, not yesterday, it was the day before. And we were on the trolley and we were about to get off. And we stood at the door to get off and the doors opened. And the people who were getting on just started walking on. Like it was almost like pushing you back. <laughs> uh, you can't even get off. And, and we stepped out on the, and then this lovely lady behind us said, my God, what's everybody doing here? Like, but it wasn't really rage, it was just like a protest about the fact that everybody was being unkind and unloving to her, you know, getting off the trolley. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty common, I, I would assume. <laughs> yeah. um, maybe controlling people? Okay, so control. Yep. And if I can add to that manipulation. Yep. It's a very common form of passive aggressive expression of anger. Um, I was thinking of like a certain a certain feeling of, of like nihilism that we have, like where there's excuse my language, but there's kind of like, well, fuck it attitude yeah. towards everything in a sense. So can we say dismissive? Yeah. Um, probably dismissive of things like uh, right the way through from a passive dismissive right the way through to aggressive dismissal yeah dismissive yeah uh, non-conformity rebellion sorry non-conformity yeah yeah I, I don't think you're very good at that to be honest <laughs> you might think you are but I've Go to Canada, there you get, you get a lot more nonconformity there than you do here, I see. But uh, I'll write it down anyway. <laughs> yep. Yes, uh, so, so, hey, rude, just being plain, downright rude. <laughs> yep, okay. If you're going to talk more than one word, you need to get the microphone. <laughs> we channel it into our political beliefs and systems. Yeah, and what do you do with your political systems? You do a lot of lobbying, don't you? Which is a form of control, manipulation, isn't it, in the end? Yeah. Sports, yes, I would say that's a fairly... Great one. That's worldwide, that one. <laughs> worldwide, that, that one. And that's why a lot of men in particular are so interested in sports because it gives them an outlet for their anger and it gives them an outlet for their fear and a lot of other outlets, actually. So that's why sports are so popular. Yeah. You laugh at things. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Competition. Competition. I'm struggling with that word. And on the end. Yes. Yep, that should have all been said into a mic, but it's very good. Pouting, refusing. Um, one thing I notice that many of you do is you believe yourself to be higher than the anger that you feel. Have you noticed that? So you believe yourself to be more developed than the anger that you actually feel. You're not allowing yourself even to feel the anger, so you revert to a lot of these kind of forms of expression of anger because you often are refusing to allow yourself to believe that you're even angry. And so what, what, one of the main problems we have here when we give feedback to people on individual discussions is, well, now you're angry. And they go, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. 
Yes, you are actually. If you just if you just allowed yourself to sit with it a bit, you'd actually connect to some anger, and that would probably be good to you. Not to express it to others, but to actually feel it. Because when you deny rage inside of yourself, that's when everyone around you feels it the most. And many of you don't understand that. Many of you feel that when you deny rage, that's when everyone around you feels it the least. And that's not true, actually. And so. You are used to, in your society quite often, you are used to pandering to angry people. You are used to doing what they want. All they've got to do is almost threaten you with anger and then you're doing what they want already. Right? Now, many of these things that we do are just a way of releasing some of the built-up rage that's developed within us that's just a way now this is what in the first century getting back to the question this is what a lot of people were doing with regard to the temple they were expre they were gossiping about it you know criticizing it you know one-on-one -on -one, being sarcastic about the fact that they just had to pay they tried to control and manipulate it and in fact they tried to even do deals with the people who were who were selling them the animals you know um in order to manipulate the price somehow. Um, a lot of them decided they weren't going to conform, so they decided they weren't going to do what... Even though they believed in the Torah, they weren't going to do what it said as a result of it. And a lot of them were all of these things, except for perhaps sports and laughing. <laughs> Pretty much everything else was in the list for them, right? And so when I pointed out to them what was going on, they're, they connected with their anger for the, for the first time in many cases. And for many people, when they connect with their anger for the first time, they just go berserk. Right? And I'm not suggesting that's what you need to do. I'm just saying that's what happens for many people. They just go berserk. And as a result of that, there is usually, and quite frequently, if you look at what happens on telly nowadays or with different countries, quite frequently, a riot ensues right? because of all this built-up rage that's within. Now, what we notice when we're travelling a lot is that a lot of people do not understand how much anger they have and how much they want and demand other people to do what they want. And we see that as a very unloving projection at other people. Does that make sense? And... What we find is most people believe they've resolved that issue in themselves. And most people, particularly, who come along to sessions about love, think they're already loving to a degree. Right? When there's very little self-reflection, because most of the time these emotions and many others exist within them, which are an indication of the build-up of anger and rage within them. Now, sometimes it's aimed towards one gender. So, in other words... The, there might be women who try to do some of these things towards their men. Right? So that's a, the rage of the woman developed towards the opposite gender, aimed towards that gender in terms of having things fixed up for them. The same applies to men. There's a build-up of rage and anger in men. In fact, you know why most men go fishing and go to the pub? Because they're actually quite sad about their relationships and they try to avoid their relationships as a result to avoid their own sadness. And so they go and do things that the woman doesn't desire to do. And they do it purposefully. They want to go to the pub, so the woman doesn't want to come. So that gives them a bit of time off from the projection of rage. Does that make sense? Or they want to go you know, fishing. And they know, for the majority of women, they don't want to come. Right? They don't want to sit out on a boat, rocking, getting a bit sick, drinking a few beers. <laughs> and occasionally wheeling up a, uh, a, an animal to slaughter. <laughs> so, so, so that's a way they can get away from them and enjoy the fact that they're having some peace and quiet from an emotional perspective. And a lot of that is driven, by, again, by anger. Right? A lot of it's driven by anger. And a lot of what we do in our day-to-day -day life, even the choices we make and everything, are driven by anger, in fact far more than what we're usually aware. Okay, Is this one that if you could comment about objectifying the opposite gender as a, uh, 
as an expression of rage. You, um, you mean in terms of sexually objectifying? Yeah, the like a lot of women um, talk a lot about men and are critical of men or their bodies or project a lot of men. Yeah. But often there's a lot of rage in that, isn't there? Of course, yeah. And the reverse and is versa. true, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, I think you've said. Okay, sorry. What needs to be said? <laughs> <laughs> I left it as a question, <laughs> but then I answered it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly true. Is that oftentimes what we do is we're so angry with one gender that we start criticising even something that God put on that gender, such as the man's penis, for example. <laughs> a lot of women objectify or crit are critical of that as a way of pulling down the male. And, uh, and, and that is an expression of their anger, in fact. When we have like class-based systems, that's usually an expression of the anger as well. So, so when women have a group that excludes men, or men have a group that exclude women, that's all about anger, actually. So the average... Uh, do you have uh, things like... Well, you have bucks parties here, I think, don't you? Like, what do you call them? Stag, Stag parties. And what's the opposite from a woman's perspective? Bachelorette party, isn't it? Yeah. And usually it's only the other women who are their friends or the other men that are their friends that are invited. Is that the way it works? Yeah. That in itself is an expression of anger, in fact. Excluding one gender over another is always an expression of some anger or rage at some point. Um, culturally, we have things where we exclude people as well. So, and sometimes we choose to exclude them via... You know, you might, for example, here, many people can speak two languages, right? But they still continue to speak the language that excludes the other person from in being involved in their conversation. That's an expression of anger. Because if you loved everybody and you knew that one person could only speak English but you can speak Spanish and English, what language would you choose? You'd choose English. That's the kind thing to do. You wouldn't choose Spanish and just have the person completely at sea, right? And things like that are frequently chosen because we're quite angry. We, we, we want to, about something, about, and you know, sometimes it's culturally we're angry about something, or from a male or female perspective we're angry about something, or we just have general anger about control or lack of control. So therefore we want to manipulate every situation to our own benefit. And in fact, uh, many of us, when we're angry, become ultra-selfish. Right, so I'd like to put that up as number 14, but it's one of the major ones that we see happening in most Western societies. This is development of almost complete selfishness and being self-absorbed. Not being in tune with what's happening in the rest of the world or in the rest of your community or in the rest of an audience or in the just being totally focused upon what you want and that's it. Now... I think we had uh, an example of that down the front with two women yesterday. Did you notice that? Where they were just totally absorbed in their own self, right? And that's all. That's all they were absorbed in. They didn't care about the rest of you. They didn't care how much demand they had. They didn't care they were jumping in on conversations. They didn't care about any of those things. And that's because of their own complete self-absorption. And those two ladies actually yesterday were interesting because they felt they were loving. They felt they were developed in love. Right? But how did it feel on the receiving end to you? It didn't feel very loving to you, did it? Like for the majority of you who were here yesterday, you would have noticed that. So this selfishness is also an expression of anger. We get so angry that we haven't got what we wanted in our life that we start deciding that we're going to get everything we want now. And everyone else can be damned, really, is the way we see it, generally. We don't care very much about what other people feel. Thanks, Carl. Mike's coming up. Could you talk about what we can do to help ourselves get in touch with these emotions, fear, anger, that are below the surface that we don't even know that are there, or we know that you know, it's there, but we really can't even feel it that much? Well, it gets back to our discussion yesterday, really. I think I've already told you how to do that, to be frank. The, the, the way to do it is quite simple. Use your will to be self-reflective. 
and to be far more self-reflective than you're currently being. You know, every time you notice one of these things coming out of you, ex see it as what it really is, a passive, ex aggressive way of expressing your rage. Like, and then question yourself, why is it present? Why is it there? What, what's the underlying controls that I have that are in place here? So you see, like what, what I find happening quite uh, frequently in discussions is that everyone wants some kind of a rule book, right? This is why the Bible did so well. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's, the, it's the most published book in the world by, by millions of copies, the Bible is. And why is that? Because it gave some basic rules that the average person could just read and say, I'll follow that. Without having to think or feel anything. You see? And what I find happening quite frequently in discussions with people is that that's what people want me to do. Provide a whole list of rules where you don't have to think or feel or be self-reflective. That you just follow the rule book and everything will be all right. And that also applies to getting to your emotions, Carl. Like, the choice to get to your emotions is driven by you. Only you. So only you can decide what you're going to do to get to some of these emotions or even awareness that some of these things are, are linked with your anger can only happen by you being willing to reflect upon yourself. Now, when we say we're in denial, there's a difference between... Like, let's talk about perhaps two things, because this is very much connected with the discussion about rage, right? So let's talk about two things. We often say that we have been, the first one is ignorant. Right? In other words, we say, I didn't know, you can't expect me to have known. That's what we tell ourselves and that's what we tell other people. And you know, many people get to the spirit world, they're living in the hills and they're screaming at God, why am I here? You can't expect me to have known whatever they need to have known, right? And in fact, there's a lot of rage in that, this whole idea or concept that you can't expect me to know how to be loving. The reality is the excuse of ignorance is just an excuse. Ignorance is actually a choice that we make just like all other choices that we make. Remember, we wrote down the five things on the side of the board. Maybe we should write them down again and we can see how each one of these things relate to the expression of anger. So what was the first one? All right, next one was will. Next one, humility. Truth and love. Okay, so if we just keep those down the side, let's have a look at how this reflects. If we are ignorant, it's because generally, not always, but generally, particularly in Western society where we have a barrage of information coming from the world to us at any one point in time, we have a barrage of information coming from the world to us about ourselves and also from the world to us about the world itself. We have huge amounts of information. Most of us in Western society can read, so we're not limited by what we can read. Most of us have a television, right? so we watch something at least on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and so therefore we have a huge amount of information at our fingertips. What information do we choose to engage? Most of the time it's information that just brings us a bit of pleasure. That's the information we choose to engage. Right? And that's because we choose to be ignorant about what's really going on. It's a choice for many, for many of us. Now, it's not a choice for everyone in the world. There are many people in the world that have no education at all. They're never given an opportunity. If you go to Kenya, the average girl doesn't get educated at all. Right? So if you go to Africa and Kenya, the average girl doesn't get educated at all and 75% of them will be raped by the time they're an adult. Now, that, that's a lot worse situation, isn't it, than what we have in Western society generally. So you could, you could forgive a person in that situation for, one, for, for being ignorant. Because obviously many of them don't desire it, it's forced upon them. 
But in our countries, Australia, England, Europe, here, here in America, and most Western countries, there's no excuse to be ignorant, actually. It's a choice that we've made to be ignorant because we want to ignore a whole heap of things. It does come from the word ignore, does it not? <laughs> and what is he ignore? Isn't that just a step away from denial? Isn't it? And if we deny things, can you see that this is, a, this is a, about using our will? You can also see that this is about not being humble to what's happening in the world around us. And you can also see that it's not wanting to know the truth of what's happening in the world around us or in our personal lives. So if we choose to remain ignorant about our own situation, we're actually in denial of developing our will properly, developing humility and developing our desire for truth. And so we could choose to no longer be ignorant, couldn't we? And that would mean that we are interested in everything that's happening around us. That we know what, what's happening. And also know the results of our own choices on the world around us. Right? Okay. What do you think the second thing might be that we do? Well, I feel the main thing we do, the second thing we do that's really quite negative as well, is the link, which is the denial. We start denying with ourselves. We go, no, I'm not like that. I'm more concerned than the average person. You know, we, our country goes to war and we go... I'm more concerned. I wouldn't vote for that. It's not my fault. It's not something inside of me emotionally that's creating this desire. We deny our own emotional condition so much that we don't see the link between two things. Between our emotion that is stored inside of us and what that causes in the world. And also in our personal life. So, I'll give you an example of this. If something doesn't go smoothly in my life, I don't blame everybody else for that. I go, wow, there must be some emotion in me that causes it to not go smoothly. Because I know that in the end, once I'm at one with God, everything will go smoothly. Everything. Like... And I have had glimpses of that, you could say. Like I've had days where all I've had to do is think about something that I wanted to do and other people arranged it for me. And I never called them or anything. They just arranged it. I didn't project at them that they had to arrange it. I was perfectly happy to arrange it myself. And yet they still arranged it. And I've had days where that's, I've had a series of events like that in, throughout the day where I've decided, well, today I've got to do these five things. And, and sure enough, all of those things happen really, really smoothly. In fact, now what I've learned to do is learn to just feel the desire, make sure the desire is pure. In other words, not selfish, not for just myself, but the, re the reasons why I have these desires are for you know, other people oftentimes and, and also to express the truth of how I feel. And all of a sudden, a lot of things happen as a result. They're drawn together as a result. So I know now that if things don't go smoothly, then it means there's something wrong. So Mary knows that when we go out to dinner, for example, I always get what I want. It's not because I demand it. Right? I don't, don't, it's not like that. It's, I go there, I know exactly what I want before I go. Wherever we go to dinner, I know exactly why I'm going to that place. <laughs> I know exactly what I want. 
And I'm always kind and considerate with the way in which I deal with the staff that, that are preparing our meal and generous with them as well. Even in Australia where people don't tip, I tip. Right? And, and so I'm always focused on how can I show people appreciation for the fact that they've given me what I want. And as a result of that, the majority of people when we go out to dinner always give me what I want. Always. Not because I'm demanding. Now, I've gone out with another guy to dinner and he sits there scowling most of the time because he never gets what he wants. And I'm going, well, and he's saying that it's the fault of the, of the proprietor or the you know, serving staff or something like that. But I'm going to myself, well, no, that, that's not what it's like for me. I always get what I want, even when somebody's really upset. I still seem to get what I want. They seem to be kind to me, at least. Um, so why is it that that happens? There's got to be something inside of the individual that attracts things, isn't there? Yeah? Well, it's based on how much love is coming out of your soul in terms of what is going to come back to you in most of these situations. So, so when we go out to dinner, myself and Mary, and this is not a criticism of Mary, but we often find that Mary doesn't get what she wants. <laughs> Isn't that true, darling? Yeah. And, and so, and Mary has some emotions that come up generally with that. One of them is that, one is that the serving staff very rarely listen to her. So she'll say very clearly what she would like, but they don't do it. Right? Now, we don't see that as a problem with them. We see that as something going on inside of the soul of the person that that's happening to that needs to be worked through. Now, when Mary connects to that emotionally, she feels like she goes right back, back into her family of like, the fact that nobody really listened to her. No one, wanted, no one wanted to give her what she wanted. And she's yet to release the grief of that. Does that make sense? And because she's yet to release the grief of that, often that's what gets attracted when we go out to dinner. Now, once Mary works through that emotion, she will be the same as me. We'll go out to dinner and we'll both get what we want. And that happens a lot more frequently now than it used to, doesn't it? Now? Does that make sense? And just to give you an idea of our, the different way in which we deal with a situation, this, was, this is an event that happened nearly six or seven years ago. So it would be, when we were coming back from England, the first trip together, it would be six years ago. And I think I've told this story in another seminar where I was the only person on the plane that didn't receive a meal. So I, we, we pre-order our meal because we're generally vegan or fruit is what we eat. And, um, and so I had a pre-ordered meal, which was a vegan meal. And uh, everybody... And Mary had a pre-ordered vegan meal. She received her meal. And I did not. And Mary goes, tell them. I go, no. I don't want to tell them. I need to feel some things. So I'm there in the plane. This was from England to Australia. Crying in one of the seats on the corner. Right? About the fact that I didn't get my meal. <laughs> right? And I connected to quite a number of different emotions in that place where I felt like people ignore me, people don't even notice that I'm around. And this was what I was like in my, in my family as a kid. I, because I did everything for everybody when I was a child, nobody noticed me at all. You know, the other, my other brother and sister in our family, they got pretty much everything they wanted if, if, and usually because they complained and therefore got it. Whereas I never complained and so therefore never got anything, right? And, and, and I felt there was sort of almost this punishment for being more loving than that. So I was just feeling about that, had to cry about that. Anyway, after I finished crying, which was about 20 minutes, I think, this host, host comes up, a male, I think it was a male host comes up, said, you didn't get a meal, did you? I said, no, I didn't. Um, he said, well, I can find you a meal. I said, oh, well, I'm vegan and it's probably, you know, there are probably no meals left, you know. Like, I don't eat meat or, or any animal products or anything. He goes, let me see. So he goes off and he brings me back a first-class vegan meal. 
and I didn't even have to ask for it. He just brought it. And Mary's looking at my vegan meal going, <laughs> it, was, it was a super nice meal, wasn't it? As far as plain fair goes. And, uh, and Mary was then wondering why she had advised me to, to ask for, <laughs> for the meal in the first place. But to me that illustrates what I'm trying to illustrate to you and that is most of us don't understand the link between what is in our soul, what needs to come out, and what we've created. And it doesn't mean that we're being punished or anything. It just means that there's something in our soul that prevents things from running smoothly in our day-to-day -day life. And so what most of us t finish up doing is denying this link. So you get a headache, for example, as I talked about yesterday. What do you do? You go and get the headache tablet. That is a denial of a link emotionally. Because the link is denial of sadness, suppression of sadness, causes headaches. All you needed to do is have a cry and your headache would probably disappear. And you're refusing to have a cry internally. So your headache will appear. And then you deny the link between the headache and what emotion you're trying to suppress. And so what you do is you search for an alternative way of suppressing it, which is some kind of tablet. All right, some kind of pill. We do this all the time. We deny the link between the emotion and the causes in the world and, I should add, in ourselves. Well, probably the better way to say this is the emotion and the effects it has upon the world. Because the, uh, the cause is the emotion itself. All right? The cause is the emotion itself that we're in denial of. And we choose to deny. So when we choose to deny, we do all sorts of things. Sarcasm is a choice to deny. Every time you get sarcastic with another person, you're choosing to deny something inside of yourself. And instead, you're reverting to an angry expression of your denial to somebody else. It's not kind at all. It's very unloving. Right? It's actually an expression of anger. I would define that as anger, an expression of anger. The average person says, oh, it's just sarcasm. You know, what's wrong with you? Surely you can take it, <laughs> you know. But it's actually a very unloving ta action to take. So when we choose ignorance or we choose denial, we are setting ourselves up for passive-aggressive expression of our rage. What we're doing is we're creating a, you could say, like a fertile ground for our rage to just sit in and stay, stay, stay there, stay there, stay there. And eventually it's going to build up and build up. And at some point, we'll revert to this overt expression of our rage. And that's what happened in the first century when I yelled out to everybody, don't you see what's going on? You're all getting ripped off here, <laughs> you know? This is all unloving. Do you think God would agree to this? And of course, in their hearts, they all felt, definitely not, definitely not. But, it, but there was so much built up anger in them by this stage that they then thought the result would be have a riot rather than just feel how angry they felt about the situation. And this is why, like in Europe, for example, there's often riots at soccer grounds, right? Because there's so much built up rage and then when the team that they support doesn't get the result, bang, the rage flares into violence. And often that's the case. Many of us are just a smidge away from violence, actually. Just a small distance away from actual violence. And that's why we often are also on tender hooks with each other because we realise, oh, that person's just a smidge away from violence. That person's just a little distance. I've got to be careful with that person. I don't want to trigger that person or say something that might harm that person. They'll be in a flare-up and then I'll be in lots of trouble after that. And so what we finish up doing is we pander to the violence. We pander to the persons who are in this rage. And this is a very common thing that we've noticed here in particular in the USA, but it happens frequently in most countries, to be honest. 
in different ways. It just depends on the cultural acceptance of, of, those, of the ways in which it occurs. So, for example, when we went to Brazil, many of the women have a huge amount of issue, rage issues with men. And all you have to do is say that to them and they'll walk out on you. <laughs> and then many of the, them together, men and women, have a huge amount of um, issues about their belief systems. In other words, if you just say to them, look, um, and, and they're very interested in what I would classify as spiritualism belief systems, of course. So, so, you know, they are often very, very influenced by spirits. And if you tell them exactly what's going on with the spirit, they're in a rage with you. Like, so much of a rage that although we had at the time, I think Denny was there, we had about, uh, at the time before we come, there was like 50 or 60 possibly coming along to a group we rock up, they hear about a few things that we've said, and now five people rock up. And we had, I think, one in Sao Paulo, there was three people other than the people who were travelling who came to our seminar. Three people. In a city of 20-something million people. That's how much rage there was about the things I was talking about with regard to spirits. The spirits themselves wouldn't even... They were so angry they wouldn't even allow anybody to come <laughs> to our sessions. But it's all because of this denial of emotion or wanting to remain ignorant of what's really going on. Yeah. Any sense? If we, who was next, actually? There was, so if we come over to here, actually, we come here and then we'll go across <coughs> to here. I had a question on law of attraction, uh, personal law of attraction versus, you know, group law of attraction. You know, I'm, I'm assuming when an airplane crashes, everybody on the airplane didn't attract that event. And, and just how those things kind of connect. Did you say everyone in the airplane did attract the event? Didn't. You didn't know, I wouldn't think so. Oh, I mean, okay. I don't know. That's... Did it happen to them? Yeah, it did happen to them. Oh, so okay. They attracted me. Well, yeah. that's, <laughs> that's part yeah. of it. And yeah. So if we look at an airplane crash, yes, every single person on that airplane attracted that event. And not only every single person on the airplane, every single person that hears about the event and every single person that was affected by the death of their loved ones in the event are also, have also attracted the event. Does that make sense? Well, it sure cleared it up for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, in a presentation I did in Melbourne in, I think it was 2009 or something, or 10, um, one lady asked me about uh, law of attraction events involving rape. And I outlined on the board all of the connecting effects of a single rape. Does that make sense? and who actually attracted the event, right down to the person who watched or heard about the event on telly. Because if you even hear about the event occurring, you've attracted that event. You understand? Yeah. You, there's a part of you that is unhealed that attributed or, or contributed to the attraction of that event. We don't understand on earth how much we are linked together. We don't understand at all. What we think is that we're some kind of individual walking through the world without any effect on anybody else, and that's not true at all. We have complete interconnectivity between all people, right? So every event that occurs that you hear about or see or notice, even if you notice it six months later, or 12 months later, or two years later, or something that you read about from 100 years ago, is a law of attraction event. These are all ways for us to see what is inside of ourselves and deal with it. Does that make sense? And that's the beauty of what God does. What myself and Mary do is we assume everything that happened is our attraction. Now, that's not to say that many of these events... Um, we see them. We see them generally. The average person sees them as very negative events, and we don't see them as a negative comment about our personal um, condition. 
we see them as a comment about our personal condition. Can you see the difference? Like, if you see them as a negative comment about your personal condition all the time, you obviously are coming from the perspective that there must be something wrong with you that created the event. But there can also be things that are right with you that created the event. Even an event which is like a crash or where somebody dies, there could be something right with you that creates those events. All right. So it's far better, to, far better than seeing whether they're right or wrong. The better thing to do is to ask ourselves, well, what inside of me participated in this event? The fact that I've heard about it or been a part of it or my loved one has been a part of it or I was in the event. So in the spirit world even, after I've passed, I'd go, okay, I died from an air crash. I obviously attracted that event somehow. Does that make sense? So if I was a spirit now who died from the event, I'd be going... I want to have a look at what caused this event, what inside of me might have contributed to this event. And a lot of what's inside of us can be all sorts of things that, that we don't consider at the time. Things like our concepts about science can contribute to an event. Our belief systems that are false about science, for example, can contribute to an event that eventually kills you. Our desire when we were a child, to have accidents in order to get approval and attention and feelings from our parents, which we didn't get unless we had an accident. That can contribute immensely to an accident. Does that make sense? There are all sorts of attitudes and feelings ranging from belief systems about the world right the way through to personal emotions that we want fulfilled ourselves that can create any event. And if we're really open about it, what we will do is we allow the, the event is, has occurred and we just let ourselves feel about what happened. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, sometimes nowadays, to give you an illustration personally, I order equipment frequently. You know, obviously we share a lot of uh, you know, electronics equipment to other people around the world in order to distribute the divine truth that we're pre presenting. So, so we order, I order, almost every week I'm ordering something, you know, and usually it's quite a lot of things, you know, where, where we might buy 10 discs at a time or 20 discs at a time to back up data or, you know, all sorts of things might come. It's very unusual for me now to actually receive something that's faulty. Does that make sense? Now, I had a spate two weeks before we left uh, home where every single thing I ordered that week was faulty. It arrived faulty. Now, it's interesting because I wouldn't have thought it before then, but I had to go out and, and yell and scream a bit outside because I was angry about the fact that everything I'd ordered <laughs> that week was faulty. And I had to go outside and have a good yell and scream about it before I could connect anything emotionally about it. Does that make sense? And the irony was, this particular week, every single person that I tried to contact to fix the problem would not respond to me. They would not respond to me. I tried to phone them, they wouldn't respond. I tried to email them, they wouldn't respond. Like, and we were, like, a week later, we're going overseas for six weeks. It was like, all of this gear was going to have to be sent back, but they wouldn't even tell me how to send it back. They wouldn't tell me anything. Right. So I had to go out and yell about that a fair bit outside as well. <laughs> Does that make sense? The fact that every person was ignoring me was what came up for me emotionally. They were just ignoring it. And then uh, it was interesting too with the events, because with all of these events, because I had a strong feeling that the people who sent the guilds to me actually knew that they were faulty before they sent them. In Australia, I don't know if that happens here, sometimes they'll do that and then when they get it sent back, they'll blame it on the freight insurance and therefore they're able to claim the fault as a freight write-off, you know, insurance write-off. And sometimes they'll do that purposefully in order to get the insurance money for that particular piece of goods, knowing full well that they broke it before they sent it. And the reason why I suspected that was because 
many of the packages had been pre-opened, which is pretty unusual. Most times we get things like you do here, all wrapped up and closed up and, you know, no one's pre-opened it. So I had to go out and feel about that. <laughs> the fact that they knew in advance that it was faulty and they just did it for the sake of their own, like, expedience, really, their own, like, desire to rip off the insurance. So I had to feel about that. So already I'm up to three processes out of this, <laughs> right? And then we started trying to resolve the issues, didn't we? Babe? And then Mary felt so sorry for me by this day that she started helping me resolve some of the issues. But because we were starting to get pretty close, and I've got, usually before we go away, we've got a lot of work to do. Like there's a lot of work copying, you know, get editing data and everything. So we, by the time we've got away, we're up to date with all of those things. So. So usually the week before we go away is really very, very, very busy for me in particular. So Mary starts helping me try to chase it down. For Mary, it all goes smoothly. I had to go out and feel about that as well. <laughs> but, but the one thing I do see, that it, the fact that I had to go out and feel about it, was, and now I'm pretty sensitive to what it triggers, of course. But the fact that I go and feel about it means that the events were my attraction. Does that make sense? They were what I attracted. And I had to work my way through the different feelings that got created as well. As it turned out, we resolved all of the events the day that we travelled. Right? But I feel that if I didn't process at least some emotion during that week it's highly likely I would have had to actually accept all of those goods that we ordered as faulty and just taken to the dump. Because none of them worked at all. And if I hadn't processed some emotion, we wouldn't have even got a response from any of these people before we went away. And of course, by the time we come back, they would have all said, it's too late now. So it would have all been written off. Yeah. Can we be unloving to plants or inanimate objects in the process of processing our emotions? Of, of course. Not so much to inanimate objects, but certainly to living objects like plants and animals and all sorts of insects, creatures. Where you, you, honestly, what do you do when an insect, when a mosquito lands on you? Bang, bang most people, right? Um, would do that. That's being unloving to a a law of attraction event that you actually drew to yourself. Now, I can understand why you do it, because you're angry. Right? Isn't it? Would, would you kill anything if you weren't angry? Probably not, right? So you must be angry. If it were, or you might be afraid, but either way, you, you killed it. So it's a response. It's a law of attraction event. And the fact that your body drew that insect to you and that insect was willing to bite you is an indication that there's something inside of you that's open to that. Now it doesn't mean there's something negative inside of you necessarily. It could be, when I say negative, it doesn't mean that you know, you're a terrible bad person because it could be just simple that you don't have a good opinion of yourself. Something like that. And that causes insects to bite you. Does that make sense? So, and in fact, if you put all the people who get bitten by insects very frequently together, and you put all the people who don't get bitten by insects frequently together, and then you analysed psychologically their feelings about themselves, you know what you would find? That all the people who get bitten by insects actually have poor self-worth. So you could actually choose to have the insect land on you, and, you, and watch what it does, you know. And then you could go, okay, if it's just crawling over me and, and then flies off, well, that's one response. If it lands on you and bites you, that's another response. You see? And all of these events are attractions that are occurring in your soul. They're, they're all things you attracted. It's happening to you. It's not because insects want to eat, drink blood, that they cause to bite you is because you are open to somebody sucking your blood. 
No. And then if you look at your life, you go, yeah, but basically I'm open to people doing that too, pretty much. Like, not from a literal sense, but from a vampire sense of sucking my time, sucking my energy, sucking my life out of me. And a lot of times that's driven by a lack of worth. Now, the average person would respond angrily to that. So if somebody sucked your life out of you, you get all upset and you go, oh, that person, I don't want to spend any more time with them. What I'll do is I'll create some boundaries so that they don't you know, spend time with me and we, we, we intellectually create these boundaries so you can't spend any more time. But what we've got to do also is feel about these things. Why do these things happen to us? They happen because there's an emotion inside of us that we're not addressing. That's why they happen to us. So if we analyse the law of attraction, and I've given many talks about the law of attraction, but I don't know if I've ever actually given a complete talk about the law of attraction, because almost everyone gets very, very confronted about the law. And, and so what we find happening is everybody goes off on tangents about it and I, and I never get to present all the information I want to about the law itself. But the law of attraction is a law of love. Because remember, every law that God created is based around love. So the insect biting you is a loving way to inform you about your soul condition. It's far better than a person biting you or a dog biting you, isn't it? An insect biting you is a much mi a minor event, is it not? Although sometimes we might think not. But each one of these laws are a loving law. And what God does constantly is all of God's laws are constantly being loving to us, trying to show us what's going on in our life trying to demonstrate to us what the problem is inside of our soul. Now, the problem might not be how we treat other people, although often we, it is about that. So there are usually two or three, or shall we list all four, things that we need to consider with our problems with regard to the law. The law of attraction is going to expose, number one, how others... Treat others and how we feel about it. Does that make sense? So in other words, you're watching something on telly. It's about something going on in Africa. It's about, let's say, something that we saw recently. And that's certainly our law of attraction because we can, we're working on certain issues, Mary is and my, I am, about sexual abuse and stuff like that regarding a, women, a woman getting abused. And what happened was we, we just read a newspaper article and the, the article, I think it was, in, it was in the news, but it was on, I think it was on, a, on the internet, wasn't it? And, and the article, I think, said something like 75% of Kenyan girls will be raped by the time they are, I think it was 14 years of age. Right? And it said that uh, some 99 point something percent of them will not be educated any longer than one year. Something like that. I forget the exact statistic. Now Mary and I are reading it. Right? What does that tell me? There's a feeling that I and Mary need to deal with about that statistic. Does that make sense? There's got to be something going on inside of us that has drawn this piece of information to us, which is an outrage, really. So there's a, it might be anger first that you feel about it, then you might feel some fear about it personally, about you know, and sadness about it. And if we reflect on our personal lives, like quite some bad things happened to us in the first century, both to myself and Mary, in regard to abuse. And so we have to feel about those things a bit more, obviously. Otherwise, we wouldn't have attracted any information about that event that would affect us at all. So, firstly, it's about how others treat others and how we feel about that. 
The law of attraction is there to help us come to terms with that. All right. The second, what do you think the second one might be? How others treat us. And how we feel about that. What do you think the third one might be? How we treat others. And what we and they feel about that. And what do you think the fourth one, fourth one might be? I treat myself. Now, I'm going to reorder these in terms of our preference. Because that's not the order that we prefer to deal with these issues in. What would be the order, do you think, of how we prefer to, to deal? Reverse the last two. Four is one, you reckon? Let's talk about it a bit. How many of us believe there is any of our emotions involved in that event? If we're honest with ourselves. How many of us actually feel that there's any of our personal emotions involved in that event? Right. Do you feel it's your fault that event occurred? No. How many of you think it's your fault that event occurred? Or something in your soul that caused the event to occur? Yeah, you're not being honest with yourself, honestly. You were doing it just earlier, that's why you asked the question, right? Yeah. So this is what we don't understand. Almost every question you ask about what others did to other people is complete ignorance about your own participation in the event. Pretty much. In fact, to me, this, this is what we prefer to believe. We prefer to believe... It, this is distancing ourselves from it. So, so our preference of seeing things, in other words, our openness to truth, if we look at it from our openness to truth, we are more willing to talk about those events than we are about anything else. You look at your society, isn't that not true? You're more willing to discuss all the things happening all around the world, in what's happening in your own country, what's happening in your own community, before you discuss anything about what happened to yourself <laughs> and your own f personal faults. You want to examine the faults of the world before you examine your own faults. Does that make sense? The average person does this, do they not? Examine the faults of the world before they examine their own faults and their own participation in the faults of the world. So that we, we actually have a preference to do that, I feel. In terms of, not as an analytical perspective, but rather from a perspective of, I don't have to deal with something in that. In other words, we, we prefer that from a perspective of denial. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? We prefer to talk about events in the world so that we can deny any participation of our own in them. And the average person does this. The average person goes, oh, isn't it terrible what happened over there? And we're, you know, we go on merrily with our lives. We don't have any personal reflection, generally, that there is something wrong with what happened over there because of something we did. Or some emotion, more importantly, some emotion that's inside of us that caused it or created it. Do you follow that? So generally, I find what most people prefer to do is talk about those events. They talk about them. They do nothing about them, generally, but they talk about them. Mary's all projecting at me as well. You don't agree with me, but that's fine. <laughs> When Mary does that, it's like so off-putting for me. It's like the other half of my soul, what's going on now? Jeez. <laughs> but how others treat others is something we generally talk about without analysing our own part in. 
how others treat us, we're pretty hot on, aren't we? You treated me badly. No, that's it. You treated me badly. That's it. Sometimes we even think that when someone's treated us nicely, it's badly. You know, like you often see this in a in a relationship. The husband wants to express sexual sexual feelings towards his wife. She says, "That's bad. Don't do that. You're being demanding, or whatever." Uh, she thinks it's bad, but when it actually might be good. You know, it's nice to have somebody interested in you sexually. Actually, if you think about it. Unless you have certain fear or certain anger about it, it would be quite a nice feeling. Okay, so how others treat us, we have a tendency to deal with probably more readily. In fact, and we have an openness to discuss it generally, don't we? In fact, if you think about it, we probably discuss it pretty frequently. That person, you know... Uh, what Denny did to me the other day. I have to tell you about it. I have to share it, you know. I find this happens to me quite frequently where, you know, I say something to somebody, do you know what AJ said to me? <laughs> and, like, it goes worldwide on forums and stuff, you know, like, <laughs> what, I, what I said. And a lot of times it's not what I said, but, you know. And sometimes it's tempting... Oftentimes we have a recording of what I actually said, and if you compare the recording to what they claim I said, it's quite often quite different. But it was their interpretation of what I said, and they think I've treated them badly, and so that's where it gets uh, how others treat us. We're really intent on dealing with that. But then I feel, personally, that these two are usually reversed. We are usually happy to start looking at how badly we treat ourselves. And in fact, in the Western world, this would probably come as a higher priority order even, because we become self-involved quite frequently, and so we're only interested in how we treat ourselves. And we're very insular, we don't even see how what we do affects anybody else. And this is very common. And sometimes we're willing to feel about what we do. Um, sometimes we're willing to feel about what we do in terms of our soul that allows this treatment of ourselves to occur. Whether that treatment be poor treatment or treatment where we believe we're superior to others. And in fact, I feel, I feel the, the, there's two primary issues. There is poor treatment of myself or poor self-opinion. Or you could say poor self-worth. Or we have an inflated self-opinion where we believe we get it and nobody else does. All right. Both of those are treating ourselves badly, actually, from God's perspective. But usually we see that one as treating ourselves badly and that one as us having self-love. And it's not having self-love. If you have self-love, you don't sacrifice your love of self. You don't sacrifice the love of others for the love of self. In other words, the love of others and the love of the self are balanced. They're, they're identical. You honour another person's will as much as you honour your own, not more or less. A person who has a poor self-opinion honours other people's will more than their own. A person who has an inflated self-opinion honours their own will more than others. If you truly love, you would do neither you would have the same opinion of your own desires as the desires of others. You would have the same feelings associated with them. But we don't want to address those issues, generally. But the last issues that we want to feel about generally are how we affect others. Or let's make it more personal. How I treat others. I find the biggest amounts of denial and ignorance generally revolve around this area. Right. How we treat others. We, we believe we treat others good and generally other people don't treat us good. <laughs> That's what we have a tendency to believe. And we're not willing to, in particular, to feel about these things. In other words... This, see, this one here is a lot about repentance. 
In other words, it's the way that we treat others that causes the most damage to our soul generally. And in fact, it's the way these two things and this one here that causes the majority of damage to our soul. Now, the majority of people don't believe that. The majority of people believe that it's the second one that causes the majority of damage to your soul. This one here. My pen's just... No, it's working. No one's going to run out. Does that make sense? The majority of us feel that how others treat us caused all of our soul damage. And then when I talk about, you know, you're brought up in an environment, and you're brought up in a family, and you're brought up, and what happens before the age of seven often determines the rest of your life. And most of us then feel that that's what is causing most of our soul damage then. And so this gives us someone else to blame, right? Doesn't it? It gives us a lot of, we can say, it's always mum and dad or it's always our environment or our school teachers or whatever who created all of our damage. But it's actually not. What they create, created was a fertile ground for us to choose to be unloving to others. But we still had to make a choice. We had to deny that we were being unloving to others and we had to remain ignorant that we were being unloving to others. So we had to make those two choices. And then we had to choose to actually do unloving things to other people and make that choice too. We had to choose to impose their, our addictions upon other people. So we had to make that choice as well. Right? And this is what we eventually do. We, we, we think that this is our main problem when our main problem is the rest of it. How we treat other people, how we treat ourselves, and how we allow others to treat others without feeling about it at all. These are our primary issues of love. Now, any person who focuses on these three things in their life on earth and works their way through that, they, they will eventually get to a lot of the emotions associated with this anyway. Because they will have to go through repentance, which will trigger a lot of these emotions of how others treated you. You'll have to go through forgiveness of yourself right? which will also help you to forgive others and you'll have to go through the awareness process of self-responsibility of what's inside of ourselves and how that harms other people which is that one you'll go through that eventually and the law of attraction this law of love is there to help you with all of those things but as I say the majority of people don't look at those things they only look at that with the law of attraction. That's all they look at. Can you see when you close down all the rest and you only look at how others have treated you with the law of attraction, you're pretty much cutting off at least three quarters of your own development. Everyone's very quiet about this subject. Can you feel also, whenever you go quiet, can you feel the spirit influence upon you as well? Can you feel that? Because the energy, not only of yourself goes down, but also the whole group seems to go down. So there's obviously something going on, isn't there, under those circumstances? What do you think is happening when I talk about these issues? What do you think is happening? Any ideas? If we come down here. Um, there's an evoking of divine truth for myself as far as that essence coming in. So there's some truth coming to us now. But what is it truth about? It's a personal truth, isn't it, that we're having to reflect upon now. It's a lot easy. It's easy to talk about other stuff. But when it starts talking about oh, how am I, what, how do I react in my life, now we start getting, whoa, it's getting a bit heavy. Right? Isn't that what happens? And many of us start feeling guilt. We start feeling like we've got a bad conscience about things that have sometimes that have happened in our past start coming in. 
And then, of course, there's a whole heap of spirits who are in places they don't want to be in and they want everything else other than themselves to be the reason why they're there. And most of us in our personal life have the same feeling, don't we? We want everything, if something bad is happening in our life, we want to blame everything other than ourselves. And if something good is happening in our life, we want to say it was all because of ourselves. <laughs> Isn't that how we are? We, this is a ethical, this is something that we've discussed in a number of, with a number of people with, on our trip. Our internal ethics are often flawed. What we do generally is when it comes to our ethics we say that anything good that happens in our life happened because I attracted it. And we say that anything that was bad, well let's define bad as painful, so let's rub out bad and call it painful that happened in our life happened because Somebody else did it to me. This is what we do. And when this starts getting exposed, we start getting very quiet about the situation. We don't want to come face to face with our own unethical and oftentimes immoral behaviour. What we want to do instead is we want to see, no, it's all somebody else. It's all what other people did to me. And what I notice a lot of people doing when they hear divine truth initially and they hear my statements of how our, a lot of our injuries get created, they start going, that's all my mum and dad. I can see that. Now I've got someone to blame. Isn't it wonderful? I've got someone to blame. I can blame them for the rest of my life now. Right? And all we're doing there is focusing on how others have treated us. And we're ignoring how we've made decisions out of harmony with love and how we have addictions that are out of harmony with love and how we treat other people. We're ignoring all of that. We're, we're running away from all of that. We're ignoring what comes to our, through our law of attraction to ourselves to expose those things even. And in fact, we often find people go, oh, I've attracted this event, that's because my mum was like this. So, for example, I think Mary can probably come up with better examples than I can. I was just thinking of some of the men who believe that uh, how they treat women... Um, you know um, who I'm referring to? I think so. You're talking about um, men who feel that they're really wonderful by women. Yep. But they actually have a lot of um, expectations and demands upon women and yep. a lot of passive aggression in their relationship with women. Yep. But they believe because they're meeting the... Addictions uh, of the woman. Addictions of the woman, that they're actually a, a uh, great guy. Yeah. They're one of the... And yet, really, from God's perspective, they're a bit of a rapist. Is that too strong a word? <laughs> In other words, they sexually touch up women emotionally. They, they, you know, and that ranges from, you know, looking at a woman and her body and thinking, oh, I'd like to have a bit of that, right the way through to actually touching them many times, like touching their bottom or, you know, just brushing them or some, somehow touching them like that just in order to get some emotions. And that's all, that's all not very far away from raping them in the end. Right? It's unwelcome sexual attention. And many men revert to that. And yet many of them then say, oh, but that's what a man does. You know? like, we're built that way. Right? So total ignorance of what the actual cause is. In other words, a lack of ethics. Or they'll say... Oh, well, that's because my dad was like that, you know. And that's what I learnt to be like because my dad was like that. Or in other words, blame it all on dad. Like, your, da your dad can be abusive and you can grow up not abusive. That's reality, right? It's based on choice, what you do. There's other guys that quite often, or, and women who quite often say things like, 
uh, we had one recently, which I probably should list as a bit more detail. Um, you're projecting a lot of stuff at me. <laughs> no, no, just use the mic, baby. Um, no, so, uh, there's this lady in Australia, and I described the situation. There's a lady in Australia who's very, very generous. And what she does is she orders all this food in bulk for a whole group of people. And she does it all uh, for free, basically, by, and it's by donation. So, so, so what people have to pay for the food they order, but she does the service for them, basically, for free. And, and sometimes there's like, there's, there's like $20,000 worth of food getting ordered in one month. And she processes all these orders. She has it stored in one of the rooms of her house. She, has it, she, del she rings up every person and, and, del and you know, tells them whether it's arrived. She processes all of the orders with the, all of the different companies that are involved and so forth. That's a lot of work, as you can imagine. And she was not receiving enough donations to do it. Right? So it's, she, instead of dealing with the emotion about that, which she needs to do, which I would have done if it was me, she decides that she's going to put a $5 fee, I think it was, on doing the orders for everybody. A $5 fee. Now, that's not much, considering like this, like this two or 300 people doing these orders, right? And, and I don't know if it's that many, it's about how many is it, babe? I actually don't know. Right. But she calls everyone and spends a lot of time, she prints Explaining things. everything. So there's a lot of administrative costs. Sometimes I think it's up to 80 people, sometimes down to 20. But right. for so every person she deals with, she's actually, she's having to check with them and spend a lot of her time with each other. There's individual. a lot of time. Yeah. It's, it takes a lot of her time, as you can imagine. So she decided to just charge a $5 sort of admin fee for doing it for everybody. And sometimes it'd be 80 people. And it's only, I think it's once a month on the average that it happens. Once every three weeks. So, oh, once every three months. So, so it's, not, it's not like $5 for 80 people over three months is $400. You can't live on $400 in three months in Australia. Um, so very little money, really. She had people who weren't donating anything prior, phone her and tell her how unloving she's been. Now, many of the people who phoned her and told her how unloving she was being are the most unloving people that I've met, actually, <laughs> interestingly enough. Right? And they told her that she was being unloving because she was changing her mind about what she was willing to do which, by the way, was unsustainable in terms of her time. And, uh, and yet they told her that she was being unloving by changing her mind and that they probably would not go ahead with that, doing that anymore, as if she, they were doing her a service. <laughs> Can you imagine? They believed they were doing her a service. Now, that is a great example of a person who has no self-reflection thinking that they were doing another person a service when the reality is the other person is doing it for them. Right? And this is what we frequently do. We are so self-involved that we, we, we think that everything good that is happening is because we attracted it and everything painful that happened is because what somebody else did. And we need to stop doing that if we're ever going to grow. AJ, I actually perked up when you started talking about the things that we've done to other people and I was falling asleep prior to that. Yep. And I have the opposite emotion. Like when something bad happens, I assume, man, here I've done it again. And when something good happens, it's either my kid's law of attraction or I'm suspicious of it thinking that someone has made a mistake. Mm -hmm. That's because you're a person who has a, vo a poor self-opinion of herself. Is that not true? Oh, yeah. yeah. Someone can send me into a tizzy with a negative comment. Yep. And the positive ones just bounce off of me. I can actually feel them. Yep. But now it's more complicated because I'm thinking, am I getting an addiction met even when a compliment comes? You're getting some addictions met, but not the addictions that you think. 
So the, the addiction the, to the negativity? Yeah, the addiction is that you want to believe you're a bad person. You want to believe that you're worse than everyone else. Right. And I know that that intellectually is not correct, but I know because of what happened in my childhood that there needed to be some justification. Yes, so let's just deal with this intellectually thing versus emotionally thing. When I'm talking to you, I'm basically only referring to your emotions. <laughs> I don't feel we need to have a discussion at all about what you intellectually think. Okay. Do, do you understand? Yeah. The reason why I feel that way is it is because the soul, which is emotion, is the thing that causes the attraction. It's not what you think that causes the attraction. It's what you feel that causes the attraction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So every time you say, I, I intellectually think this, there's a reason why you choose to do that. You're trying to tell yourself that it's okay to have an intellect, an intellectual response to something. At least you've got that, is the feeling that you have, right? To, in my mind, that's almost worthless, can I say. And when it comes to changing your behaviour in your life, it is worthless, actually, pretty much. Because most people never change, even though they have an intellectual awareness of what's going on. Right? What we need to do is stop telling ourselves, oh, I know in my mind, and blah, 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 and then say something, but the feeling I have is blah, 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 blah. Forget that and just go, the feeling I have is blah, 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 blah. <laughs> you know, forget the mind thing, I know in my mind thing. Knowing something in your mind does not change your life. Right? The emotion, changing the emotion in your soul changes your life. That's the only thing that can. So that's the first thing that we need to look at. Changing the emotion in our soul is what changes our life. So stop thinking that you can think your way through change, because you can't. You have to do something emotionally to change. Something has to happen inside of your soul to change. Does that make sense? So if you, so in your comment, you were saying that basically the feeling or the emotion that you have is that it's always your fault. Whatever happens to me is always my fault. Yeah. Now, I agree that whatever happens to you is always your law, the, your, your soul attraction, but does that mean that it's your fault? And this is where I feel a lot of people get a bit mixed up with the law of attraction. They start seeing everything they attract as their fault rather than seeing it as their attraction, which could be not their fault, actually. Uh, can I give you an illustration of some of these things? How did you get to feel so bad about yourself? Oh, this is, I don't even know where to start. Um, so, so you know where to start, though. <laughs> well, first of all, my parents, um, I wasn't a planned pregnancy. Okay. Well, and how did they treat you as a result? Well, my mom went to the abortion clinic and my dad stopped her. Okay, so mum wanted to abort me. But she told me it wasn't personal, that she just wasn't ready. I mean, she did. She, she was very matter-of-fact about it. She said it wasn't personal. We didn't know it was you. Yeah, no, I, I get that. It was pretty personal considering it was right. your life, but yes. Right. I, I understand mum has that defense for her action. And then so. she wanted a son because Okay, so mum didn't revered. want a girl. No. And I don't get this, but when she was pregnant with my brother, she apparently prayed for her son. And her addictions got met. And then she was thrilled about that. You know why her addictions probably got met? Why? Because no girl in her right mind would ever have been <laughs> wanted her as her mother, right? <laughs> Except for me. Well, no, it, it's an attraction event, you right. see. You, she needed to attract a daughter right. to trigger all of her terrible attitudes towards women, right? But her mom did the same thing to her and actually I tried to abort her. Uh, I understand that, but that doesn't excuse your mum's behaviour. Right. Yeah. In your mind it does to a degree, but it doesn't. Okay. Yeah. This is one reason why you're not processing emotionally, because in your mind, 
having the history that she has, it, it justifies her behaviour. And I'm saying, no, it doesn't justify her behaviour at all. Right. All right. And wh if you stop thinking that it does, it'll help you actually feel some emotion. Okay. Uh, at the moment, it's almost like an internal statement that you say to yourself, oh, but it happened to her too, so I can't really expect her to have treated me any different. Right. But the reality is, just because, if, just because you've been abused, it doesn't mean you're going to abuse your daughter, right? You don't have to abuse your daughter just because you've been abused. Right. So that applies to your mum too. She didn't have to abuse you just because she's been abused. She, she was the quiet abuser. You know, the, my dad did the beatings, but she never stopped it. So. Well, no, let, let, yeah, we haven't even started with dad oh, yet, okay. have we? So let's, let's, let's do that. Okay. So what, what happened with dad? Um, I mean, he just beat us. So he beat you, yeah? At, at a very young age, I think. I remember my first one at two and a half. Yep. And it was for something as innocuous as turning on the TV. And okay, so you turned on the TV and got a big belt in for it. Yeah. and it, Beating. But, but my grandparents were around, my mom was around, and that's just the way it was. Like yeah, no nobody one stopped him. Nobody stopped him? Nope. Nope. Okay. Anything else that you... We haven't even got into you. That's, you. I think that's a pretty good We story. haven't even got beyond five yet, right, in your right. life. Like, so this is pretty right. young. So can you see why you feel bad about yourself? Yeah. yeah. Can you also see, though, that you're almost justifying your mum and dad's behaviour? I can't even get angry at them. And why? I, and I've tried. Because um, my dad's anger was the only anger that was permissible. No, it's also because you're afraid that you'll become the same as them if you get angry. Yeah, uh, and right. my daughter, um, it's, and it's improving, but she was diagnosed with autism. And she completely owned me. Like, I, I've been terrified her for my entire life, and she's mm -hmm. only nine. Yep. And she can control me through her rage. Well, I, I would put to you, almost anyone can control you. And the reason why is because you have very low self-worth. Right. And what I'm saying to you, you have low self-worth, but it's not your fault. How, but how, like, how do I hook into what that feels? Like, there's been a few times when I didn't have any memories of my just, childhood. Just stop for a moment. If you stop talking for a moment. Okay. I need to say it's not your fault, and you need to hear that. Because you're not hearing it. You, you want to believe it's your fault. You want to believe that there's something inside of you that caused your mum to want to abort you, that caused your mum to not, to not want a girl, that caused your dad to beat you all the time, and you want to believe it's something inside of you. Why do you want to believe this, it's something inside of you? Is the, that's the addiction, actually. You're addicted to believing that it's you. Why would, why would a person want to believe that it's their fault that all these things happened, do you think? Why do you want to believe that all of that happening was your fault? Because I don't want to see the truth of who they really are. Yes, I agree. What would you feel if you felt some of that? Uh, truthfully, homicidal probably. I get a lot of anger there. Exactly. And that's one of the feelings that you have and that, that you don't want to feel because you're worried about what you'll do with it. You see, you're worried about where you'll go in that direction, right? So instead of allowing yourself to go in that direction, what you do is you tell yourself that everything that they did to me that was bad and painful was all my fault, rather than seeing the truth. And the truth is, a child is not to blame for how its parents treat it. You, you see that? You want to believe, you, there's everything in you saying the opposite. Inside of you, you want to believe that you are to blame for how your parents treated you. Well, so some of the way that they treated us, they told us it was related to our past life karma and something bad that we'd done in a past life. In and other words, they kept saying to you that it's not my fault. Right. So in, other, so in other words, it's like me, if I'm your dad, I'm telling you, I'm beating you right now, and I'm saying, it's not my fault I'm beating you, it's yours. Pretty much. And right? Then and... and Oh, it's also what happened in your past life that is the reason why I'm beating you. You need to be beaten for what happened in your past life. Does that make sense? Yeah, and so uh, when I came across 
your teachings on reincarnation, it, it was so big for me. And I, it took me about eight months. I'm like, really, this is not true. Like my entire life has been based on this. And I had memories that obviously are now spirits with me. And I'm just really angry. Like, and, and they still believe these things. They um, blame me. They blame the autism for both of my kids on me. Yeah. And I'm looking at this and it's like, no, you guys played a part in this. Yeah. And so I guess I just need to move through the anger. Well, no, you firstly need to see how you prevent your end. How do you... If you, if you look at it, what's going on in your soul, you've basically got denial, anger, fear, and grief, right? This is now I'm talking about childhood emotions now. What you've chosen is this, but you've chosen it with regard to the truth about what your parents have done. What you're basically doing is you're telling, you, in order to prevent your emotional feelings, you're telling yourself that it was all your fault that it happened. And what I'm suggesting to you is the only reason why you believe it's all your fault that it happened is because your parents taught you that it was all your fault that it happened. Right. That's the only reason why you believe it. It's not all your fault that it happened. It is an attraction event, but it's not your fault. And this is what I'm trying to illustrate to people, that not all attraction events are your fault. They are the responsibility of other people. There is something in your soul, of course, that allows it to occur, but that was created by the very people who created the events. So the reason why these kind of events continue to occur throughout your life is because the people you grew up with wanted to treat you this way. It wasn't because you deserve to be treated this way. Does that make sense? And it's very important for you to see that. Like, if you saw that, you would already be crying. Do you understand? If you saw that, you would already be crying about your life and what, how badly you've been treated. But you're not allowing yourself to see that because you were taught this by people who were very cruel to you. I wouldn't call them parents. They're, they're abusive, nasty individuals. Right? And I'm perfectly happy for them to hear what I'm saying. Well, they, they don't listen. Are you kidding? Sorry? <laughs> they, they don't listen to you. Um, you know, you confront, like, everything about their lifestyle. And of course, I don't expect them to listen yeah, to me. I'm just no. saying, I'm perfectly happy to call them what they are. Abusive, nasty people. That's what they are. They are so abusive that they do the worst possible thing that an abusive person generally does, and that is they blame the person they're abusing for the abuse. Now that is an indication of a deep darkness inside of their soul. Does that make sense? That's about as dark as you can get. That's not much different than going like Hitler did and saying, I'm killing the Jews because they're Jews. Right? In other words, it's the Jews' fault that I'm killing them. This is what your parents are like. Very similar in condition. Does that make sense? They'll end up in a very similar place if in the spirit world as well, by the way. Right. Yeah. And I've it's not your fault. I've just started having memories of some of the stuff that happened. And I, this was one of my questions. Is, I saw images of it, and I've been able to drop into my body a few times, but I haven't been able to replicate that like on a mental level and feel what that felt like at the moment. And I don't understand how I'm seeing it from a third-party perspective. Like I can see my dad and myself or my mom and myself, but it's just kind of images and not You do emotion. it to distract yourself from your pain. These are techniques that you learn as a child to distract yourself from your pain. Okay. And you are now, unfortunately, going to have to deconstruct these techniques. Okay. Right? That is your responsibility because nobody else can do it for you. 
But it's very important that you see that all of these abusive treat this all of this abusive treatment were done by cruel people and not by people who loved you. Right? And it's very important you see that. It's so important that I'm gonna that I feel like labouring it with you, and I know the rest of the audience may not feel the same, but but it just feels like it feels to me that you are trying to keep telling yourself the message that your parents told you in order to avoid the pain of it. Does that make sense? So in a way, you've become their tool to harm yourself. You've, you, can you see that? Yeah, I can hear them right now. No, no, it wasn't that bad. And we were excellent providers, which they were. So... Excellent providers. <laughs> but that's, that's, well, that's their definition of being good parents. No, no, I'm, con I'm not concerned about their definition. I'm worried about yours. No, no, I, that's not how I feel. That no, they it were, is how you feel. That they were great providers? Yeah, you just justified it, so it's how you feel. Okay. You believe that they physically provided you for you well. No, they didn't. They violently abused you. That's not a physical provision of well-being. They, that's violent abuse. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Can you see how distorted... You, you're trying to blame yourself, for, for, which is basically all you're doing is telling yourself the same messages that your parents told you. Do you see? And this is something you've got to give up because it's actually stopping you from processing a lot emotionally. Do you see that? Every time you tell yourself the same thing as your parents would tell you, you're stopping yourself from feeling the truth about how they were. They're violent, abusive, terrible people. I don't care what food they put on your table. They are violent, abusive people. You need to see them as such. If you see them as such, you'll then have some compassion for yourself and start to feel about what they did to you, you see? But you're only going to have compassion when you stop telling yourself about them being good in any way. Because they're not good in any way that I've heard so far. Now, every single person does have some scary of, you know, God created their real self. So, you know, your parents have a real self in there somewhere. But honestly, what they've chosen to do through their injuries, the choices that they've made, particularly towards yourself and also towards their other children, I would assume, are so terrible that in the end, they're some of the darkest people that you could imagine from an from a evil perspective. Now, they can change. I'm not saying they can't change. But it's highly unlikely they're going to when they justify their own behaviour, their own abusive behaviour towards their own child. And what concerns me more is that you're justifying their abusive behaviour towards yourself. Do you see? And what I'm suggesting to you is you do that so that you don't have to feel the pain of what they did. Do you see what I'm saying? That's why you do it. You do it. What they did caused terrible pain to you. Physically, emotionally, terrible pain to you. What they did was terrible. And what you're doing by blaming yourself is you're letting them off the hook for that. Now, God's not going to let them off the hook for that. Right? There is a law called the law of compensation where they're going to have to compensate for every little bit of damage that they did to you. But what's important for you to recognise is that every time you tell yourself you were to blame, you are not allowing the process of an emotion that you feel. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Does everyone get what I'm saying there about that? You see, many of us have been t treated so badly that we believe that the bad behaviour is actually normal, and that we deserved it. Right? And this is not true. This is never true. It doesn't matter how bad a person is, they don't deserve tr being treated badly, ever. Right? And the fact is a child doesn't deserve it at all. 
A child deserves protection, not poor treatment. And when we tell ourselves that this is normal, we are feeding the addiction of the abuser, which is to tell themselves that they're doing it because it's all your fault. Now, I don't know how many of you have grown up in this kind of environment, but how many of you have grown up in an environment where dad or mum was smacking you and telling you that it was for your own good? Okay. All of you have a distorted viewpoint of love if you've grown up in that environment. It's not your fault that you have a distorted viewpoint of love. It was browbeaten into you by a parent who's belting you, in other words, assaulting you, while they're telling you that it's for your own good. Now, if you look at an adult environment, if you were getting assaulted by somebody and his defence in court was, it was for your own good, how well do you think it would go for him in court? It wouldn't go very well for him in court, would it? And yet, how many parents get away with assaulting a child and nobody even takes them to court? <laughs> Everybody just goes, oh, well, that's called discipline right? and then we have the religious justification of this so called discipline which is in, like in the book of Bible book of Proverbs where it says if you spare the rod you'll spoil the child right? of course that's not the intention of that statement, the intention of the statement is if you spare some form of control, in other words if you allow a child to be uncontrolled then of course you're going to spoil the child. And that's very true. Right? If you allow a child to do everything at once, any time it wants to do it, it will eventually choose to do a lot of very unloving things, which is definitely going to spoil the child. But that doesn't justify using violent assault as a method of correcting the child. Right? And yet in our society, we believe violent assault is a valid way of correcting a child. We believe it so much that when we see it occurring, we do nothing about it. That's how much we believe it. And as a result, many of us grow up thinking that we are to blame for things that other people did to us. You're never to blame for somebody treating you badly, ever. They are to blame, they are responsible in God's eyes for treating you badly. And once you recognize that, you will actually get closer to your emotions of grief about that. If you don't recognize that, you'll stay a long way away from your grief. It's a way of distancing yourself from your grief. Telling yourself that you were to blame for it anyway. And what I'm suggesting is stop doing that to yourself. Recognize when you are being treated badly... When, particularly when it was violent, like in many of your childhoods, it was violent. Recognize that that is poor treatment from people who did not know how to love you. Recognize that. Because once you recognize that, you'll be allowed to grieve it. You'll be allowed to cry about it. You'll allow yourself to grieve it, even, and let it go. But if you don't recognize the truth you can never enter forgiveness of a person. Do, do you see what I'm saying? If, if you're not recognizing the truth, how can you forgive what happened? You first must see what happened before you can forgive what happened. Do you see? And the only way that we can progress from an emotional perspective is by firstly seeing the truth of what happened. So that's number one. See the truth of what happened and then work through our emotions in such a way that we can forgive what happened. But if you refuse to see the truth of what happened, then you'll never be able to forgive what you don't believe happened. Right? You'll never be able to forgive it. And so it will stay within you. Thank you.
So that would be the objection to the Course in Miracles is that you deny that something happened so that you don't ever have to feel the emotion. Yes, I have many objections to the Course in Miracles, but that would be one of my objections to the Course in Miracles because basically whenever, in order to heal something, you have to recognize the truth of it first. So for ex if I can give you some examples. If I did something to another, I have to recognize the complete truth of what I did, the effect that it had on them, the effect it had on their life, their children, their grandchildren, their friends, their acquaintances. Let's say I did something that was unloving to them. It will have an effect not only on them, but also on the rest of their life, generally. Now, if I'm ever going to enter repentance for what was done, I have to face the truth of all of that effect. Right? And I have to face the truth that I am the cause of a lot of those effects that happened in their life as a result of my poor treatment of them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, if I don't face the truth about what I did to someone else, I can never repent. I can never be sorry because I'm not facing the truth about what happened. Mm -hmm. You can't repent for something that you don't see. You can only repent for all the things you see. Mm -hmm. And if you really are going to repent for all the things you see, you need to face everything about what you did to another. Now, the same applies, applies to what others did to me. There was an effect. There was an effect on my, oftentimes, entire life. Many of us, when we're 60, 70, 80 years of age... We're still living in the effect, because we haven't healed it yet, we're still living in the effect of events that happened when we were five. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. That's how much of an effect there is. For, for us to forgive the other, because remember, we can't make them be sorry for what they did. <laughs> no. <laughs> All we can do is forgive them in the end. But to forgive them, we have to face the truth of what they did and how much of an effect it's had in my entire life. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So to truly forgive, I have to face the truth of what others did to me and to truly repent, I have to face the truth of what I did to others. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, if we extend this now, and just see the relationship between these things, so now, this one here is repentance. And this one here is forgiveness. These are the two most powerful principles of, of your entire life to practice, in fact, in a lot of ways. Because when I say the two most powerful, these are the laws of love. These are laws about God's love now that we're discussing. Some of the most important laws that you can ever learn about in the universe are the, well, the only important laws, in my opinion, are the laws about God's love. You learn about those laws and you will understand everything that you need to know about the universe. This law, the laws of repentance and forgiveness are about the laws of divine love. So in other words, you cannot receive divine love without understanding and actually practicing these two things. And we need to understand the relationship between truth and these things. You cannot repent for something that you do not acknowledge you did. You can only repent for the things you acknowledge you did. So you can't enter some kind of insincere process here with regard to repentance. To truly repent for something that you did to somebody else, you have to know the truth about the effect of it on their entire life. You have to see it. 
and feel sorry about it. Right? And to truly forgive, you have to know the effect of what others did to you that affected your entire life. And you need to at some point work through the feelings about that to the point where you no longer have any feelings about that. And that's called forgiveness. If you do those two things, you will be free of everything. And your whole life will immensely change if you do those two things. Right. Do you want to come over here? Um, I have two questions. Um, the first one is about, and I, in the context of what you've just explained, um, how can we distinguish between our own emotions and those of our spirit attachments? Well, often uh, our spirit attachments are, are what, what I'd call sympathetic attachments. So they'll either be of the same emotion that we have or completely the opposite emotion that we have. So that's where they get confusing. There'll be one or the other. I don't feel that you need to worry about that so much, though, to be honest. All you need to do is face the truth about what happened to you that others did. Not what you prefer to believe they did, but what they actually did. Like, so sometimes I see people blaming other people for something that there was nothing wrong with at all. And that's not facing the truth about it. So for, for exa if I give you an example of that. We walk into a supermarket. We're getting served by a person at the counter and the person in front of us is yelling at the person at the counter. And we go, and the person in front of us completely believes that she's justified to have a yell at the person behind the counter because some good goods were terror, you know, weren't fresh or whatever reason, whatever reason that she's come up with. She believes she is telling the truth. She's not. The truth is the person behind the counter is serving her. The person behind the counter is giving her a gift of their time. You have no justification to get in a rage with them under any circumstances. Even if they're obnoxious, you've got no <laughs> justification to get in a rage with them. Right? But if they're serving you and not obnoxious, there's certainly no justification. Right? And a person who believes that they are able to get into a rage with the person behind the counter is not facing the truth. And the truth is that the person behind the counter is doing a service. Right? That's the truth. What we need to do is face the truth, not what we want the truth to be. Right. Now, in this case, let's say the truth is that the person behind the counter did put the particular goods out and they knew and they admit that they knew that the goods were faulty or whatever. Now, of course, there is a truth that the person chose to treat us badly. We only have one option from God's perspective and that is to forgive them, mm -hmm. <laughs> even if they're not sorry. Does that make sense? Yes. So they could have chosen to put that, those goods on the, uh, out on the display, sold them to us, fully knowing that they were faulty, and still I do not have a justification for holding on to the grudge from God's perspective. But the truth is the person was unloving. Agreed? In taking that action. That's the truth. If I face the truth, I will start feeling about my feelings about that truth, which are probably going to be, why did they do that to me? That wasn't a nice thing to do to me. And then deeper than that is, why do they think I deserve that? What in me feels I deserve that? And we start feeling about all those feelings. Once we've processed through all those feelings, we can forgive the person. Whether they're sorry or not is immaterial. And in fact, it's highly... Uh, it's not recommended at all to wait until they're sorry because a person who chooses to take an unloving action is highly unlikely to be sorry before you forgive them. That's reality. 
But most people who take unloving actions do not see their unloving actions for many, many years. Right? And you don't want to waste your life holding on to the grudge and not forgiving during that period of time because it affects the rest of your life then. Right? So what we need to do is we need to learn to face the truth, actual truth of a situation. Now, whether we've got spirits attached or not makes no difference. We still need to face the truth of the situation. So when we have spirits attached and we know, we, we just face the truth. Wow, I've attracted these spirits. And these spirits are treating me badly. How does that feel? It feels terrible. It feels just like the same as my mum and dad treating me badly or anybody else treating me badly, right? So just feel it. Because as you feel it and you release that, you go into forgiveness, you will no longer draw those spirits to you. That's automatically going to happen. So you barely have to worry about the spirits. All you need to do is process through the truth about any emotion. Not what you want it to be, but what it is. Right? So in the case of the example before that was listed, you were wanting to believe that you're to blame. Isn't that not right? So if you're wanting to believe you're to blame, that's not the truth. You were a child. How can you be to blame for abusive behavior? How can you be to blame for the fact that your mum didn't even want you before she even knew you? How can you be to blame for the fact that once she had you, she'd prefer to have somebody else? How can you be to blame for any of those things? The reality is none of that is your fault. Right? So facing the truth is none of that was my fault. None of it was my fault. That was their vicious, abusive behavior. And once we start acknowledging that their behavior was vicious and abusive and had no underlying reason, we will start feeling the grief associated with that. Does that make sense? And by feeling the grief, we're starting the process of forgiveness. That's what we're doing. So forgiveness can only occur once we face truth with humility. And repentance can only occur once we face the truth of what we've done to other, people's, other people with humility. They're the only times that those two things can occur is if we face the truth about them. Not what we'd like to believe. So the average parent, you know, a child comes along and says, Dad, do you realize that when, you, when I was five and six, you did this to me and you did that to me, and what I'm realizing now is that that's affected my whole life. Right? And, and what does the dad normally do? Don't be stupid. Get over it. That happened to me anyway. <laughs> right? I didn't know any better. So what does he do? He comes up with all these justifications. Is he facing the truth? No. Is he ever going to be repentant? No. Until he faces the truth, he's not going to be repentant. The fact is, the choice and decision he made had an effect on his son's entire life in a negative way. And unless he faces the truth about that, he is never going to be repentant. And if he doesn't repent, he is never going to receive God's love, to be honest. Because God's love is dependent upon repentance and forgiveness when I say dependent upon once where our heart opens to these two processes our heart is open to receiving love before then our heart is not open to receiving love so it's like we're pushing love away all the time right? that's what we're doing and until our heart opens to those two processes love will continue being rejected continually be rejected so without these two things, in the end, we won't receive God's love. We won't receive a transformation of our soul without these two things. So they need to happen. But the only way they're going to happen is if we face the truth about the events. And that means facing the truth, not what we want to believe is the truth. Right? We need to face the actual truth. Now, a child who's being beaten by her father and being told by her mother, motionless or not, that she never really wanted her and she wanted to abort her and only dads prevented that from occurring and was told by her mother that she, it would be better if she was a, a boy. The child is not to blame for any of those particular events. The child had no choice about any of those particular events and therefore cannot be responsible for those choices 
no matter what the child's personality or nature, they're not responsible for the choice. That being the case, the child must face the truth that the event occurred because of the vicious, abusive, destructive behaviour of her parents. And only for that reason. And that the parents are cruel and unloving and they never cared for her. Otherwise, they would never be able to say such things or do such things to her. That's what she needs to face the truth about. When she faces the truth about that, she can begin the process of grieving this terrible treatment. Once she grieves the terrible treatment, she will go through the process of forgiveness. Once she's gone through the process of forgiveness, the terrible treatment will no longer have an effect on her life. Does that make sense? Once it has no effect on her life, she will feel joy and happiness and, ever, and even remembering the events will not cause her to feel any more sadness until, you know, as long as she has dealt with all of her sadness, that will be the result. So she'll be a happy person, enjoying her life, enjoying her, but it's highly unlikely she'll ever want to see her parents again, to be frank. Not because she's angry with them, but because they would still be abusive if they saw her. <laughs> Do you understand? Until they go into repentance, they will still abuse her. So in the case of a woman who's been treated badly or a man who's been treated badly as a child, if you're still seeing your parents after that has occurred, it's an indication that you've not even begun yet the process of forgiveness. Because you would go through forgiveness right out the other side. And once you come out the other side, you will have love of yourself. When you have love of yourself, you will no longer put yourself in a situation where other people treat you badly without being repentant for what they do. So in other words, if someone treated me badly, I would say, I would, and I felt hurt about it, I would go through my own hurt first, which is what I have had to do with almost all my situations. I haven't done it all with every one of them, otherwise I'd already be at one with God, right? But then what I would need to do is once I've gone through all my grief about it, I have forgiven. But that does not mean that I'm going to put myself back into the same situation every single day so that they can abuse me some more. Because by now I'll have some self-love and I would go, hang on a sec, you're vicious abusive people. I don't want to spend any time with you until you change from being vicious, abusive people into somebody who's nice. And the only way you're going to do that is by being sorry for what you've done and you don't even think you've done anything wrong. And if that takes 100 years or 200 years, like Mary's parents in, her first, in our first century life have yet to do that. Mary's parents treated Mary abusively in the first century and they are still in the hells of the spirit world because they are yet to go through any repentance for how they treated Mary. 2,000 years later, we're now 2,000 years down the track, and they are still in the same location in the spirit world that they arrived in without having dealt with anything because they have not been repentant. They're not willing to see how badly they treated her. You don't want to spend time with people like that. No. It doesn't matter if they call themselves your mum and dad. Like, they're abusive, vicious people. They're not your mum and dad. Anybody who's your mum and dad is going to treat you in some loving way, right? Not in an abusive, vicious way. They're not your mum and dad. They're just people who brought you into the world and they had sex and even then they didn't probably want you. Otherwise, if they did, they would never have treated you this way. So, so what we need to do is go, okay, we need to feel that. It's the avoidance of feeling that that attracts spirits. So every time we avoid facing the truth and feeling about the truth of what we did to another, we will attract a group of spirits who justify that behaviour. And every time we avoid facing the truth about what others did to us, we will attract a whole heap of spirits who want to do the same thing to us. If we want to avoid these attractions from the spirit world, the best thing we can do is face the truth emotionally about everything that happened to us and face the truth emotionally about everything we've done to somebody else, then we'll avoid almost every attraction from the spirit world because we're in the process of learning how to love through that process. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we don't have to worry about what the spirits are doing with all this. All we need to be concerned about is what 
we need to do, and that is we need to face the truth about these two sets of conditions. That's all we need to do. That, that brings me to my second question, um, which is like many other Americans, I have suffered from the addiction of overeating. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm, I'm struggling to understand the unlovingness to myself around that and the um, self-abuse. And I know I share this problem with many, many other people. Mm -hmm. so. I agree. Your, your culture is becoming quite obese yes. on the average, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. So, so what is the underlying cause of this self-abuse? Well, I thought that it was avoiding emotions. I was, that's my theory. I, mean, I agree. It is avoiding emotions. But what type of emotions does it avoid? Fear, anger. I, almost any emotion, really. Yep. Um, so, so I've noticed that I eat when I'm afraid. I eat when I'm angry. I eat when I'm bored. I eat when I'm lonely. I even mm -hmm. celebrate with eating when I'm happy. Okay, <laughs> okay, yes. So you can say there's a whole heap of negative causes, but also even the things like I'm happy, so I eat. So yeah. I eat. But it's not always loving because I'm not eating things that are good for me. Of course, yep, of course. So the question then becomes, what's really going on as to why you're eating? What do you, what do you think it is? I don't, I don't know. Well, what, what's eating doing? It's distracting myself. Mm -hmm. Yep. What else? For yourself. It's nurturing myself. It's an attempt. Is it's it nurturing? I mean, it's not really. Getting fat is not nurturing. No, so no. it's not nurturing yourself. I mean, well, I guess not nurture, but comforting. I agree. You're comforting yourself. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's that doing? Protecting why does a person, myself. Why does a person need comfort? Because they don't feel, they don't feel good. They feel Because they don't want to feel grief, Distressed right? or, or grief. They don't right? want to feel distressed, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you said protecting yourself. So what do you need protection from? Feeling, being overwhelmed by feelings. Okay. So there's your reason why you overeat. You're protecting yourself from being overwhelmed by feelings. So then I have to feel the feelings. Well, the well, first thing that needs to change is you need to have some kind of desire to feel the feelings develop, don't you? Because mm -hmm. at the moment, your desire is to protect yourself from your feelings. Right. F to fi it's, it's one thing to say, feel your feelings. It's quite another for you to want to. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, yes. So you could say at the moment, your train is headed in the direction I don't want to. And th this other, so it's a, we could say that's like, that's like um, Los Angeles, right? That's, uh, that's the I don't want a direction and that's the direction you're heading to. So you can say New York is the I want a direction and your train's heading towards Los Angeles. <laughs> what are you going to do? I have to turn the train around. You have to turn the train around somehow. So how are you going to do that? Being more aware of my denial of those feelings or my unwillingness to feel them. Yes, I would say there's something that has to happen before then. There's something about your will that has to happen. I before. have to want to? You have to want to. Yeah, at the moment you don't want to. Does that make sense? The, 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 the desire in the soul is, I want the train to go to Los Angeles. That's where all the food is, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's the desire in the soul, right? I want to go there. I want to go there. I want to go there. I don't want to turn the train around. So how are you going to get from having one desire, which is I want to go in that direction, to having completely the opposite desire and I want to go in that direction? That's the question that I often ask myself, yep. is why don't I want to deal with this issue? One of the things that helps me do that, to change directions, is again, facing the truth about what's happening. All right? So, so if I'm going down this train road, which is like, there's a train wreck at the end of it, right? <laughs> Isn't there? Yeah. At some point, I'm getting bigger and I'm bigger. My body's getting more and more unhealthy. I'm, I'm getting more, you know, distressed, 
It's like a slow suicide. It's like a slow suicide. It yeah. is. It is yeah. like a slow suicide. And by the way, this applies to if you're smoking cigarettes or overeating or drinking too much alcohol or any of the kind of addictions that we have that are physical addictions are really slow suicides in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, with, the, with regard to all of them, we're paying somebody else to help us do it as well. Uh, so you're paying, you know, cigarette, uh, basically um, cigarette companies to help you suicide if you're smoking cigarettes. Or, and you're, or you're paying, you know, alcohol producers to help you suicide if you're drinking too much alcohol. And it's the same with food. You're really paying all the grocery stores to help you suicide, uh, which, which obviously means that you really badly want to. But you don't want to just cut your own throat or shoot yourself. Instead, you want to do it slowly, and that tells you what? I'm afraid. Well, doesn't it tell you that there's almost a macabre, there's almost a macabre way to, pre to commit suicide? It's even more unloving, perhaps. Yeah, almost, isn't it? And I'm not suggesting a person should suicide because that's just as damaging. Right. What I'm suggesting is that we need to, at some point, see what we're doing, see the truth of it. So, so if I saw myself getting bigger and bigger and bigger, I would be going, hang on a sec, the truth of this is I mustn't love myself very much. I don't want to feel my emotions because every time I have any emotion I eat, it's telling me I don't want to feel my emotion. And by the way, you could choose to exercise and still have the same, it, it, it'd be a similar addiction in a way, wouldn't it? Yes. Every time I have feel an emotion, I've got to go for a run. <laughs> I know people like that. <laughs> yeah, there are people like that. There's plenty. You know, that's acceptable by society standards, but it's still an addiction. It's the same kind of addiction, it, with the exception that it has a bit of a less effect in terms of the body mm -hmm. as getting larger does, obviously. But... What we need to do, instead of doing that, is we need to come face to face with the effects of what we're doing, firstly. So you need to see that this is not because your body is not the same metabolism as somebody else. You need to see that it's not because of any other thing other than choices that you are making. Right. You need to see where these choices will result, what it, they'll eventually end up doing to you. And then you might start facing the truth of why you do it, which is all about avoidance of an emotion. In other words, you're so scared of feeling almost any emotion that you want a solution. Right? Right. And my suggestion is your desire needs to firstly change. In other words, instead of desiring to ignore the truth, you need to switch that around to desiring to accept the truth of what's happening. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's number one. Because without that, and the truth is, you must not love yourself. That's the truth. Yes, and I don't understand why. Uh, you don't have to understand why. Oh, okay. You just need to feel that you don't love yourself and talk to God about not loving yourself. Does that make sense? Yes. You don't have to understand why because God will show you why through the process. You don't have to do the work, remember. All you need to do is connect to God and, and receive love. At the moment, you don't want to receive love because you don't believe you're worthy of that love. If you did, you wouldn't be overeating. Mm. Does that make sense? Right. So, so obviously, there's an issue of self-love. So firstly, use your will to see what the damage is happening in other words, there's a train rock on the road to Los Angeles. Yes. I need to face the fact that there's a train wreck coming. And, that it, and if I don't change, that's where I'm going to end up. That's important, to face the truth of what you're creating. The second thing is to face, face the truth of your state that you're in. That you feel sad about yourself. You feel like you're not worthy. You feel like... You know, a lot of those kind of things. And you're using food to protect yourself. I can see that. Yeah? Yes. You're trying to protect yourself from all of these emotions by using food. And then you need to make a choice. Am I going to continue trying to protect myself using food? Or am I going to make a different decision? And it will only be the desire to make a different decision that causes you to make it. 
in the end. So that's the main thing to look at right now. The lack of desire to make a different decision. Yeah. Now, sometimes we lack desire to make a different decision because we have no faith that a different decision will result in a different action or a different result. Do you I, see? I lack a lot of trust in myself because I've tried many times and... And failed. And, and, or, or succeeded and then gained the weight back. Right. So, so I don't have a lot of faith in my ability to maintain, I guess, my will. Well, you, you don't have faith in your... See, when you've, when you've gone on diets before, have you dealt with the emotion? No, never. Of course. Yeah. The emotion is the cause of you reverting to the old behavior. So you get yourself... And this is why people call it yo-yo diet, right? It's what right. yo-yo dieting. It's like diet, get slim, and then you get slim, oh, you look good, the pressure's off. The emotion is still there, feeling unworthy, and the emotion is still there, feeling like you want to protect yourself, and the emotion is still there of not wanting sexual attention. And your emotion, whatever the emotion is that caused you to overeat is still there. So what do you do? You overeat again because the emotion is right. still there. Not, not, not dealing with the cause. You're not dealing with the cause. So understand that in the past, if you've managed to let go of the weight, you've had enough will... And you've obviously have faith now that you can do it. But the problem is you have not been humble to the truth about the cause. Does that make sense? Yes. And so that's the key issue. So if you've before had the desire and had the faith and done it, but then reverted to old behavior, it's because you have not had the humility to see the truth about what the cause was. And not only see it, but feel it. Remember, the humility is all about feeling it, mm -hmm. feeling the cause. So you haven't been willing to feel the cause. When we're not willing to feel the cause, we revert back to the old behavior every time. Right? Now, it's the same with these principles of forgiveness and repentance. If we're not willing to face the truth about the real cause of these things, then we will never feel them and therefore Heal them. So, so this is what I notice happening for most people in most of their life. They revert back to old behavior because they don't understand that the cause is emotional within themselves. And unless that cause comes out of them, they will be drawn back to the old behavior every time. And as we get older, the old behavior generally becomes more pronounced. This is why most people put on weight. The older they get, there's still lack of love inside of themselves that allows that to occur. But the older they get, the more weight they put on in terms of the more fat they put on. And the reason why they put on this fat is not because their metabolism is, ha is bad. It's because their metabolism is responding to their avoidance of the emotion. Mm. Right? Your physical body... Speaking of food. Bit of an accident there, somebody had. <laughs> Your, the, the actual emotion is causing the physical response, not the other way around. Your desire to eat is driven by the emotion, the avoidance of an emo the causal emotion. That's why you do it. So, obviously, if you have the will to do it, if you can get to be slimmer again through just your will, without even addressing emotion, that means mm -hmm. you have a strong will. So that's a good thing. Okay. <laughs> and obviously, the fact that you've done it before means you have faith that you can do it. So that's already present. But the pro thing that's not present is a desire to be humble to the feeling that causes it all. That's not present. Okay. So I, that, I would pray about that, being humble to how bad you feel about yourself. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Letting yourself feel how bad you feel about yourself rather than just trying to ignore it with food. So when you're sitting there wanting to take the next bite, you put the next bite down and go, okay, sit in your body and feel how bad you feel about yourself. You could even help yourself by just undressing, getting in front of the mirror, look at yourself and feel how bad you feel about yourself. Does that make sense? Yes, and hard to do. <laughs> Very hard. Yeah. You know, we had some ladies in Australia who we just gave them a mirror Mary did a workshop and just gave them a mirror to look at 
and they had to engage a loving feeling about themselves. This was the exercise. They looked at the mirror and then they got so angry that they bashed the mirror to bits. <laughs> That's how much anger and sadness they had about themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And a lot of people are in that state where we don't love ourselves very much at all, right? Loving, love of self is a big issue. Yeah. So, so allow yourself to see that the problem isn't your face and the problem isn't your real really. You've obviously developed these two things before if you've lost weight before. Yes. For a person who hasn't lost weight before, they haven't even developed those things. Does that make sense? But for a person who's lost weight before, they've developed some of those things, but they've not been humble to the real emotion that causes their problem. Because if they were, they would have felt that and the weight just falls off. You can even eat the same and the weight falls off. Although it's highly unlikely you'll finish up eating the same. Right. But it just falls off, right? Because of you no longer needing to protect yourself from those particular emotions. Mm. Thank you very much. Pleasure. I'm busting to go to the loo. Um, <laughs> and I reckon many of you must be as well. <laughs> um, what is the time? It must be over one o'clock. Yeah, so, so what if we have a break now? Can we have a break for half an hour like we did yesterday? So come back about 10 past, uh, 10 past 2 that would be. And we're, today we're probably going to finish off around 4-ish uh, or 4.30, something like that, if that's okay with you guys. Um, can I just ask you though, after, during the break, just have a feel about the heaviness that you feel. We're, discuss we're discussing emotional topics more today rather than just theories like we were yesterday. And you notice that because of this discussion of emotional topics, there is a bit more heaviness inside of you, which, which is telling you that there is an avoidance of discussing emotional topics that mo many of you fe have some feeling about. And my suggestion is to feel how much you want to avoid the emotional topic. Does that make sense? And if you can allow yourself to do that, that would be great. Mary, you want to just say? Do you, I want... make a booking if we're going to have a dinner probably. Okay. Um, personally, no, I don't want yeah. to. Um, I have been talking for five or six hours straight. Um, so I personally probably don't want to. But ha how many of you would like to go to dinner? I suppose if, all of, if some of you would like to, you'd need to firstly choose a place and probably make a booking because on the weekends here it seems pretty busy in your restaurants. Sorry? Yeah. Is it usually busy Sunday night in restaurants here? Not, less so, not with football. Certainly. It's up to you guys what you want to do. I personally don't feel like going because I'll have been talking for a long time. Yeah. I started talking to Mary this morning quite early <laughs> as well. No worries. So can we come back about, uh, should we make it quarter past two? Give you enough time? Good idea.